Dear students, I welcome you all to this lecture on South Asia's Missing Women, which is a part of the MOOC course on Understanding South Asia. The phrase missing woman was coined by Amartya Sen in 1990 and refers to the observation that in parts of the developing world, notably in India, China, other parts of South Asia, parts of East Asia and Africa, the ratio of women to men is suspiciously low. In this lecture, we will be focusing on the South Asian region and attempt to bring out the specificities of this phenomenon therein. On average, in developed countries, there is roughly an equal proportion of men and women in the population as a whole. But strangely, this is not the case in many parts of the developing world, especially in South Asia. Gender discrimination in these societies is often so severe that it leads to excess levels of mortality for women in most age groups, giving rise to the masculinization of sex ratios in their overall populations, averaging around 105 men to 100 women and resulting in the phenomenon of missing women, namely the additional number of women there might have been in the population of these countries had mortality rates been less good. To bring attention to the fairly simple but powerful statistical phenomenon of missing women, the Nobel Prize winning welfare economist Amartya Sen in 1990-1991 used the skewed sex ratios to calculate the number of missing women in Asian and North African continent. His computations permit us to derive the number of additional women who would have been alive in say China or India if these countries had the same ratio of women to men as in developed countries where men and women presumably receive similar care. Sain's methodology suggests that more than 200 million women are demographically missing across the developed world. This is meant to be an estimate of the total number of women who have died prematurely due to gender discrimination. His analysis revealed that the proportion of women was lower than one would expect if the birth and the death rates of females were the same as that of men. Now, the question is, what could be behind these skewed numbers? These astronomical numbers have spawned a significant literature aimed at explaining the missing woman phenomenon in the developed parts of the world. The fact that millions of women are missing in South Asia has received attention from scholars, policy makers and government because of its profound human and social implications. Say, for example, both India and parts of South Asia have banned the use of sex selective technologies to reduce the incidence of female infanticide. A key question here would be reasons behind this deficit in the South Asian region. South Asia is a region characterized by a culture of sun preference, severe discrimination against daughters and excess levels of female mortality leading to what Amartya Sen called the phenomenon of missing women and an imbalance in sex ratios. The literature relates sun preference to a variety of social and economic factors in these regions which interact to make females less valuable to their families. People pressured to bear sons while limiting the number of daughters in order to conserve scarce household resources. While countries characterized by adverse sex ratios vary considerably in terms of ethnicity, culture and religious affiliation, they share certain common features in the organization of family and kinship systems. A patriarchal authority structure, patrilineal descent and inheritance, strict control over women's mobility in the public domain, resulting in extremely low rates of women's labor force participation in the labor markets. And patrilocal residence patterns so that a daughter is required to live with her husband and his kin after marriage. The loss 
that this represents to the parents who brought them up has been referred to as watering the neighbor's tree in Naila Kabir's paper of 1985. These practices interlock to produce a strong culture of sun preference in the region. A second area of focus that could explain the terrible deficit of women in certain developing parts of the world like South Asia has roots in early childhood and the possibility that young girls are systematically less cared for. For a given level of income, families with children will spend less on adult goods in order to purchase children's goods. The household purchasing may favour boys over girls and smaller expenditures on adult goods would be made by families with boys as compared with those with girls. Many researchers have detected a gender bias in the household expenditures of families leading to the neglect of the girl child. As per research, another factor may underlie this deficit. According to literature, many diseases, both communicable and non-communicable, affect males and females differently. If a disease widespread in these Asian populations were associated, for example, hepatitis B, were associated with higher rates of female mortality in uterus or in early childhood, then there would be a proportion of missing women to be attributed to the prevalence of this infection. These older cultural norms and patriarchal practices prevalent in vast regions of South Asia have of course been considerably altered by the recent histories and development trajectories of countries within this region with varying implications for their sex ratios. Population sex ratios have generally declined, reflecting an improvement in women's overall life expectancy relative to that of men. The 1990s saw the share of missing women drop by 3 to 5 percentage points in Bangladesh and Pakistan and by more modest 1 to 2 points in India. However, the decline in overall sex ratios has been accompanied in some countries by a worrying new trend. An increase in sex ratio at birth attributed to the growing prevalence of female selective abortions. The availability of immunosynthesis and ultrasound scanning has made prenatal sex determination possible, allowing parents to use abortion to manipulate the sex composition of live births. Households have variously resorted to female infanticide and postnatal withholding of health care and the mid-1980s when technology permitting fairly low-cost determination of the sex of fetuses became available, there has been a shift towards prenatal sex selection by means of induced abortion. And because cases of female infanticide are often not reported as live births, they can be hard to distinguish from the consequences of prenatal sex selection in the reported sex ratio of births. The use of this technology has led to highly masculine sex ratios at birth in countries like India and China. Compared to normal sex ratios at birth of around 105 male to 100 female births in much of the world, 2010 estimates of ratios in these countries ranged from 108.5 for India to 121.2 for China. In different parts of South Asia, findings from population data need to be better understood to enable adequate policy responses to the missing woman problem. The inverse sex ratio in this region is both endemic and cyclical, mostly perpetuated by patriarchal mindsets manifesting in widespread gender-based inequalities and violence. Over years, attention from government in the form of targeted policies have resulted in different countries showing progress on this front. 
Their students, the interesting fact is that there are diverging stories of performance in South Asia on this front. It has been suggested that the resort to female selective abortion in South Asian countries represents efforts on the part of parents to reconcile their desire for smaller families with their continued preference for sons. Yet, the transition to smaller families in societies characterized by son preference has not everywhere been accompanied by rising sex ratios at birth in the region. Bangladesh, for instance, appears to have undergone fertility decline without resorting to such means. What could be the causes underlying this divergent trend in sex ratios, say, between India and Bangladesh? What could explain the deterioration in child sex ratios in India and their improvement in neighboring Bangladesh given the fact that both countries share a common history of sun preference? The comparison of Bangladesh with India is useful because it allows us to disentangle what differentiates the experience of fertility transition in the two countries, focusing our attention on possible explanations for the diverging trends in their sex ratios. Inclusion of Pakistan, whose current sex ratios at birth puts it in an intermediate position between Bangladesh and India, would have enriched the analysis, but unfortunately there is very little research into this issue. In India, for example, improvements in overall life expectancy have closed the gender gap in mortality rates among adults, but persisting gender discrimination among children and increasing resort to female selective abortion has led to growing imbalance in child sex ratios and sex ratios at birth. In Bangladesh, by contrast, fertility decline has been accompanied by a closing of the gender gap in mortality in all age groups. Regional variations in sex ratios, typically defined as the ratio of men to women in the population, are one manifestation of the regional variations in patriarchal structures and gender inequalities. The students, we shall now reflect on the fertility decline and changing sex ratios in both India and Bangladesh. There is no immediately obvious explanation for the diverging trends in sun preference and sex ratios reported in India and Bangladesh. Many of the factors put forward for the deterioration in child sex ratios in India also apply to Bangladesh, but do not appear to have had the same outcomes. Both countries have experienced declining fertility ratios, a major factor contributing to the rise of female selective abortions in the Indian context. Many of the costs associated with daughters in India are also relevant in Bangladesh, particularly with the emergence and spread of dowry. While women's labor force participation rates have risen more steadily in Bangladesh, than India, women in both countries are largely confined to self-employment and unpaid family labor. What we need to know, therefore, is what differentiates the two contexts sufficiently to explain the divergence in their attitudes and behavior. In what follows, we explore a number of possible explanations. These relate to differences in the timing and spread of ultrasound technology, in state society relations, and the ease of social change, and in religious and cultural norms, values, and practices. First of all, it is possible that the divergence in sex ratios reflects differences in ease of access to the relevant technologies. Abortion was legalized in India in 1971, while technologies for prenatal sex determination were introduced in the mid-1970s. 
they gradually spread to rural areas, although the rate of expansion is believed to have escalated exponentially with liberalization in the early 1990s. Ultrasound technology was introduced in government health hospitals somewhat later in Bangladesh, sometime in the early 1980s. In a context where abortion was not legal, it was initially used for general health purposes and later extended to screening pregnant women. The private sector has been importing the technology since 1985 in Bangladesh. By the early 1990s, the technology was available in district hospitals and clinics at the sub-district level. However, Mobile services are still not common and most people must go to district or sub-district headquarters for an ultrasound scan. There are a number of reasons why this is not a very satisfactory explanation for the divergence in sex ratios. One is that Bangladesh embarked on liberalization much earlier than India. So, it is difficult to understand why it did not report a more rapid expansion in the use of ultrasound technology for sex selection purposes. The other is that along with adverse sex ratios at birth, Indian data shows continued evidence of postnatal gender discrimination, giving rise to excess levels of female mortality in the under 5 age group. By contrast, the evidence from Bangladesh suggests that postnatal discrimination against daughters has been declining. According to United Nations Population Fund estimates of 2012, the ratio of male to female mortality rates in the under 5 age group was 103 for Bangladesh and 88 for India. Divergences in sex ratios thus appear to reflect real divergences in sex preferences in the two countries. Another possible explanation relates to differences in the role of the state and civil society in these two different contexts. India is, of course, the world's largest democracy, with near uninterrupted democratic rule since independence in 1947, while Bangladesh has spent a great deal of this period under military rule. While both countries have legal and policy provisions to address gender inequality, it is hard likely that the increased value given to daughters in Bangladesh relative to India reflects the higher quality of its governance or the greater progressiveness of its state. The difference may lie instead in the ease with which such policies and laws were translated into intended outcomes. As Rahman Shoban has noted, while class inequalities have widened in Bangladesh in the course of economic growth, they are not as closely bound up with the deep-rooted and durable inequalities based on the ascribed identities that characterize the semi-feudal and caste-based social structures in India and Pakistan. Bangladesh society remains more fluid with considerable scope for upward mobility. Its hierarchies are more exposed to challenges from below because their legitimacy is not as rooted in the deep structures of the society. Progressive discourses about women's rights and gender equality may be easier to disseminate in the more socially homogeneous context of Bangladesh than within the more caste stratified context of India or the semi-feudal and ethnically divided context of Pakistan. It is this fluidity in social relations and the ease with which new norms, values and ideas travel across society that may distinguish Bangladesh from the context featured in the Indian case. Indirect evidence for this hypothesis relates to the remarkable progress that Bangladesh has made on number of human development and gender equality indicators, out achieving both India and Pakistan, despite its far lower levels of per capita gross national product. These improvements have relied 
not only on purposive policy interventions on the part of the government and NGOs, but also on behavioral responses on the part of ordinary people. Bangladesh was ranked at 112th position out of 186 countries according to the UN's Gender Inequality Index for 2013, while India was ranked at 132nd and Pakistan was ranked 123rd. Bangladesh was ranked 69th out of 135 countries according to the Global Gender Gap Index in 2011 compared to 113th for India and 133rd for Pakistan. Progress on gender equality in Bangladesh has thus been part of a larger story of progress on human development. The NGO sector in Bangladesh has played an important role in this process of change and has facilitated change in attitudes and practices within the wider society. The third possible explanation relates to differences in religious norms and values. Religion has certainly begun to emerge as an explanation within the Indian literature because of evidence of religious differentials in son preference, child sex ratios, sex ratios at birth and likelihood of sex selective abortion. One version of the explanation relies on the pure religion effect, focusing on religious differences in the value given to women in injunctions regarding abortion. However, it is difficult to believe that differences in religious beliefs and values alone constitute an adequate explanation for variations in sex ratios given the considerable diversity in the sex ratios reported by Hindus in India by state, caste and class. The considerable state level variations in child sex ratios noted among Muslims in India and the geographical diversity among Muslims within Bangladesh itself. A more relevant explanation may relate to the way in which religion intersects with the organization of social life within different ethnic and cultural communities in different economic contexts. The rules and norms governing marriage and kinship are of particular relevance here because of their importance for how different communities seek to preserve, reproduce or transform their identity and place within the larger society. Such an explanation would draw attention to religion as one perhaps relatively enduring aspect of social organization. Particularly striking in the Indian literature on this topic is the complexity of the rules, norms and values that govern its caste class differentiated marriage market. While the most restrictive norms and practices are associated with the dominant Brahmin caste, they have gradually spread to other sections of the population. M. N. Srinivas in 1962 used the term Sanskritization to describe the process by which lower caste groups adopt the values and practices of higher, often more affluent caste groups to signal their upward mobility. As Basu in 1999 points out, while role models in most societies are shaped by dominant groups, in the Indian context, role models have been shaped by caste groups who are most conservative with regard to women. An important study by Naila Kabir in 2014, who is a professor at London School of Economics, suggests that while individual and household characteristics contribute to some of the variations in attitudes to sons and daughters found in the South Asian region, the main explanation must be sought at the level of community norms and practices, with religion appearing as an important aspect of community identity. It is only by appreciating the different ways in which religious values and cultural norms mediate the larger forces of socio-economic change in the South Asian context that we can make sense 
of the finding that despite the growing belief in different contexts that sons are less likely to fulfill their familial duties than they used to, along with some evidence that daughters are valued for providing emotional support to parents, daughter aversion appears to have deepened and spread in India, while son preference appears to have weakened in Bangladesh. Religious beliefs and values can play a part in explaining variations in attitudes and behavior, but religions operate in specific social and cultural contexts that serve to mediate both their interpretation and impact. Thus, despite sharing Islam as the majority religion, sex ratios at birth are much higher in Pakistan than in Bangladesh and indeed in the abnormal range according to some estimates. Of the four countries in Asia that have recently reported a sharp deterioration in sex ratio at births, Azerbaijan is a majority Muslim country, Georgia and Armenia are largely Christian and Vietnam is officially Buddhist. We need a far more complex explanation for changing trends in sex ratios than a focus on religious norms and values alone can provide. The willpower of state institutions and rate at which the intended outcomes of policies are being seen on the ground matters a lot. In the context of the important issue of missing women in the South Asian region, an important question that arises here is that what are the implications of this gap between male and female numbers for the development and economic growth in the South Asian region. A cultural preference for male children in Asia, particularly in South Asia, will cost the region dearly and have serious implications for the economic well-being of this region. If we count up all the girls who were never born because of selective abortion, victims of infanticide and females who died from neglect and gender discrimination, there are upwards of 100 million women missing on the Asian continent today by some estimates. It is not just a human rights catastrophe. It is also a looming demographic disaster with serious economic implications for the region. With Asian birth rates already plummeting, that is tens of millions of women who will never be mothers. The economic and social impact on some of the world's largest countries is incalculable. In these countries, vast numbers of men won't be able to find brides in the coming decades, obliterating universal marriage, the underpinning of socio-economic organization for centuries. Having so many unattached, alienated men could have potentially devastating economic and social consequences. Some social scientists fear that incidents of rape and bride trafficking in parts of Asia could be early effects of screwed sex ratios here. One study at Columbia University by Lena Edlund attributed as much as one third of increases in prevalence of crime to the increase in the maleness of the young adult population. The theory in part is that unmarried men are more likely to commit crimes than married men, especially as they try to accumulate assets to compete for scarce brides. One important aspect would be a further fall in birth rates in the coming years due to lesser number of mothers, leading to a higher concentration of aging population rather than new births which would have shouldered the responsibility of economic growth in coming years. To conclude, rectifying the gender imbalance created by societal attitudes towards son preference matters for development and policy making. Greater gender equality can enhance economic productivity, improve development outcomes for the next generation and make institutions and policies more representative. Many gender disparities remain even as countries in the South Asian region develop, which calls for sustained and focused public action. 
corrective policies will yield substantial development payoffs if they focus on persistent gender inequalities that matter most for welfare. To be effective, these measures must target the root causes of inequality without ignoring the domestic political economy. Dear students, with this, I conclude this lecture on missing women in South Asia. I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.